when prime time continues. With each passing month, little James Leiniger seemed to be peeling back memories of a past life. Ooh, hey. Vivid memories that scared and astonished his parents. Bruce had always said, what kind of plane did you fly? Yeah. And he said, a Corsair. Yeah. He uh, said, a Corsair? He said the word Corsair. Mm -hmm. yeah. Not only did James remember flying a Corsair, he demonstrated knowledge of the plane's peculiarities, like the time he was flipping through a book about planes when he was four. And he got to the Corsair and he said, that's a Corsair. And he goes, you know what? They used to get flat tires all the time. In fact, historians and pilots agree that the plane's tires took a lot of punishment on landing. Of course, this is a fact that could easily be found in books or on TV. But then, James began to offer up the kinds of specific details his parents say are harder to explain away. A another night, Bruce had come in and he said, do you remember where your plane took off? And he said it took off of a boat. Do you remember the name of your boat? Natoma. Do you remember what your name was? And he'd always say, James. But his name is James. It never it really right. occurred so to us. Like, okay. We thought he just wasn't understanding the question. So I said, do you remember any friends or anyone else that you flew with? And he said, Jack. Jack Larson. Bruce began doing some research. Almost immediately, he discovered that the Natoma was an actual ship, a small aircraft carrier in the Pacific called the Natoma Bay. And Jack Larson, the Navy buddy little James recalled, well, it turns out there was a pilot named Jack Larson who served aboard the Natoma Bay. In fact, he's alive and well and living in Arkansas. And it was like holy mackerel. I mean, really, you could have poured my brains out of my ears. And I just, I just couldn't believe it. And there were more clues. Around this time, James began signing crayon drawings and other artwork, James III. One day I asked him why he's calling himself James III. It was because I'm the third James. And every once in a while you ask him that today, and he'll still say the same thing. And one day, while leafing through a new book about the Battle of Iwo Jima, Bruce turned to an aerial photo of the Pacific Island. James was seated nearby. He pointed to it, and he goes, Daddy, that's where my airplane was shot down. And, and I said, what? It's, that's my airplane got shot down there, Daddy. And I just went, well, I just went blank. I, 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 did, I, I, I couldn't say anything. By then, Bruce had become a man possessed, searching the internet, combing through military records, and interviewing men who served aboard the Natoma Bay. Finally, a breakthrough. He learned that there was just one pilot from the squadron killed at Iwo Jima. That pilot? James M. Houston, Jr. Is this why little James was calling himself James III? It just crystallized in my mind. This, this has to be who we're talking about. You know, my meter of skepticism was starting to go over toward belief. When little James would describe being shot down, he told of how his plane had sustained a direct hit on the end. We had an airplane, and I said, well, can you show me where it was? And he, he pointed right up to the front of the engine. That's what makes this man's story so intriguing. His name is Ralph Clarber. Clarber was a rear gunner on a TBM Avenger that flew off the Natoma Bay. On March 3, 1945, he took part in a raid near Iwo Jima. As it happens, Clarber's plane was right next to the one flown by James M. Houston, Jr. It was to be Hugh's last mission before leaving for home the following day. As Clarber recalls, the sky was thick with enemy flak. We experienced uh, pretty heavy in aircraft fire, but uh, this was the most intense that I experienced uh, at, at any time. Suddenly, a flash near the nose of Houston's plane. I saw the hit. I would say he was hit head on, yeah, right on the middle of the engine. Just as little James had described it. So what do you believe now about your son James? I believe that he had a past life. I believe that his, in his past life he was James M. Houston, Jr. Uh, and he came back because he wasn't finished with something. And that's essentially what I believe. Dear Bruce and Andrea. And he's not the only one. This past October, the Leinigers received a letter from a woman named Ann Barron, the sister of pilot James Houston. Andrea and Bruce had contacted her about their little boy. Barron heard about what young James was saying, and she believes. All of this is still overwhelming. I can only imagine how it has affected you 
but I believe, with my love to you, Anne. The child was so convincing and coming up with all these things that there's no way in the world he could know unless there is a spiritual thing. I think that the parents are self-deceived, that they're fascinated by the mysterious, and they've built up a fairy tale. Professor Paul Kurtz of the University of Buffalo heads an organization that investigates claims of the paranormal. He's overhearing conversations of his parents. He's looking at cues. Uh, he may talk to his, his little friends or hear from neighbors. And then this conviction that builds up that, yes, he was this pilot, and yes, he will come to believe that himself. Do you ever rack your brain and say, gee, I hope... I hope I didn't say anything or do anything that put this in James' head. Do you ever question yourself still no, or no? No, because I mean, we're talking to a two-year-old. You know, I mean, what am I going to do? Sit him in a corner and say, listen, now we're going to concoct this elaborate scheme and you're going to imagine that you went through those things. I knew what he watched on television. I knew what stories I read to him. I'm a protective, first-time southern mother. There was no other place he could have been getting this information. Assuming the line is acting in good faith, what we have here is a classic conflict of faith versus science. Hard facts against beliefs that often can't be easily explained. There's no doubt where Paul Kurtz stands. People have a right to believe, surely in America, there's freedom of conscience. On the other hand, do you want to believe in something that is false? So how do you rationalize a belief in anything bigger than ourselves if you have to fall back on science all the time? Uh, not simply science, on the facts, on common sense. Once upon a time, the Leinigers might have agreed, like but that was before the amazing do? stories told by their young son forced them to consider the possibilities and to examine their faith. Whether you believe in reincarnation or not, it's about the eternal life of the human spirit. That's right. And that's something God promises to us. But there is something else out there after this. It's not over when you die. James's vivid recollections are starting to fade as he gets older, but among his prized possessions are two gifts sent to him by pilot James Houston's sister, a bust of George Washington and a model of a Corsair aircraft. They were among the personal effects of James Houston sent home after the war. Do you feel differently about James? Has this changed your relationship with him? No. no. We, we have always felt that he's a special little boy because he's our son. Uh, he appears to have experienced something that I don't think is unique, but the way it's been revealed is quite astounding. Go. It, it doesn't change how we think. I don't look at him and say, that's not my son, that's someone else. That's my boy. Good one. It might be a natural assumption that it's just Buddhists and Hindus who believe in reincarnation, but would it surprise you to know that one out of every four Americans, Christians and Jewish alike, believe that souls do return again in different bodies? We'll be right back.